Q&A. It's been so much fun. We've had last week, we had a blast. Anybody have fun hearing, getting, being able to ask some questions? We're calling this your series because you're just going to get to answer uh, the answers to questions maybe many of you have had. I don't know if uh, you're like me, but I did not grow up in a particularly a Christian home. And uh, even throughout life, I had lots of questions uh, about just life and things in general. And I didn't really even, even not even being a Christian home, my parents didn't like to answer lots of questions for me. And I grew up in a church that didn't necessarily like to answer lots of questions. My church's answer was just stay home and read your Bible to lots of questions that I had growing up. So this series is just been, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Today, I would uh, just caution you, uh, this is kinda, gonna, gonna kinda be a PG-13 day. We promised uh When we started this series, that no question is going to be unanswered. If you have a question, if you send those in, we'll answer those for you. We believe this. We believe that there's a lot of questions in life that should be answered by the church and should be answered uh, through Scripture, and they don't get answered. And we believe that a lot of people learn what they learn about life and relationships and general uh, from areas in life that they shouldn't be learning them from. They should be learning them from God and from the church because he has a way. If you know this, he has a way and a plan for our life, a good plan perfect plan for us, and, and we just want to be able to help disciple people according to God's plan in Scripture. So today, if you've got some questions, we're going to take some live questions also. Uh, I'm going to give you the number. It is 205-807-0001. You can write that down, 205-807-0001. Maybe you're going to be sitting here this morning and listening And a question may pop into your head. Just text that in and we may possibly be able to get to those questions as we go today. So I'm just going to ask Derek to pray for us. And then we're going to dive in. Uh, You've got some notes in your worship guide. There's some blank notes if you'd like to take notes and keep up with us today. So Derek, why don't you go ahead and we'll get started. Ready? Jesus, we thank you so much for this opportunity. God, we ask that you just bless this day and our efforts. May we speak truth today, your word, God, and that you'd give us wisdom for areas maybe that Um, there's not a clear answer. God, I pray that we would all enter with a spirit of nobody getting offended and everybody just uh, being that there's going to be some different opinions. And God, we just ask above all things you'd be honored today and that you'd be blessed in uh, this time together. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Now remember, it's going to be, this would be a perfect day if you've got uh, children and maybe you want to try out our children's ministry. Uh, we have a great kids ministry, age appropriate, that they would love to be a part of today. And again, if we have, uh, if, if the answer is just, it is evident in scripture, we're going to bring what the Bible says, what God's word says. If it's not evident, if there's a gray area, maybe scripture doesn't talk about it, we'll tell you if we're giving you our opinion about that. And again, everybody can agree to disagree. Everybody uh, is entitled to be wrong sometimes. Yep. All right, here we go. <laughs> question number one. The, uh, we had this question sent in this past week. It says, thinking about the Old Testament, are we to read it as historically accurate Or should we look beyond the narratives toward the main point it conveys? Uh, And in this question, they even kind of gave an example like Jesus did in the New Testament. Because a lot of times, Jesus didn't necessarily give a a, a true story. He would would tell parables and he would tell stories to illustrate uh, the point he was trying to make. And uh, I guess my, my answer to that question would be yes and no. Yes, we should read it historically when the Bible speaks historically. Uh, there's, there's, the Old Testament is broken down into five different categories. So you've got the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible. And even those would probably fall into the history category. There's historical books in the Old Testament. There's poetry or writings. There's the major and the minor prophets. And uh, all of these are broken down into those categories. So I would say this. That when the Bible speaks historically, when it, in, in other words, when it tells us that uh, something happened in history, when it lays that out, then I would say, yes, we take that as history. We take that as a true fact because we believe this. I've, uh, I've got a scripture on the screen for you. It's in 2 Timothy 3.16, and it's, uh, it says this, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So I would say this, that even before uh, we had written scripture, because the Old Testament wasn't even actually pinned down, it was actual a verbal uh, communication up until uh, Israel was held captive in Babylon. So they actually started writing down the Old Testament in, in, when they were in captivity in Babylon hundreds and thousands of years after uh, it was even passed down. So for generations and generations, the Old Testament was passed down word for word. They would actually just recite it to their children. If you read in Deuteronomy chapter 6 uh, and 7, it was talking, uh, there's a 
there's a command given by God to Israel, and it tells them to talk about the word, talk about the law day and night, when you're going to bed and when you're rising up. And what he was saying is memorize it, make it a part of you. David even said, God, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So they actually memorized the Old Testament. That's how it was passed down for generations. So when they would tell their children of stories that had happened, it was true statements to them. This is what happened to our ancestors. This is what happened to our forefathers. So I would say when the Bible speaks in the Old Testament of history, then we take it as literal. When it tells us that it's uh, speaking, when it's uh, a poetry like the Song of Songs or the Book of Psalms, uh, things like that, lots of those we can take as allegory or we can take as different uh, er avenues of writing so that we can maybe grab the point out of that. All right, we good? Oh, yeah. All right. So question number two came in uh, last week, actually, and it says this. Will my infant child who passed away be in heaven? What do you think, Derek? Well, this is uh, one of those tough questions, I guess. Um, I'll just say up front, the Bible doesn't have a verse that says that a stillborn baby or that a baby that dies at an early age is going to be in heaven. There's no clear-cut a verse that just says this is going to happen or this is not going to happen. Uh, this is also uh, sensitive, I understand, because I had a search for this actually in my own life. Uh, I had a, a baby brother when I was four years old. My mom had the baby, baby brother, <laughs> and uh, he <laughs> passed away. And so she, you know, was really upset about that. And so for a long period of my life, I really searched for this answer also. I feel like we can look at a couple areas to really see uh, maybe some things we can take from Scripture. For this area, uh, I love Matthew 19, verses 13 through 14, and it's on the screen as well. It says, Then people brought little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And I just love that because we immediately see the heart of Jesus and God towards children. He loves kids. And when others were saying, you know, don't get in his way, you know, you're, you're causing a scene, Jesus was like, no, let them come to me. In fact, the kingdom of heaven is made up of children like these. Now, I think that's speaking to a couple of things. I don't think it means that only kids will be in heaven, but I do think it means that childlike faith and children will be in heaven. There might even be a little bit more of a stronger story towards this situation in the scripture in the Old Testament uh, David and Bathsheba were going to have a child, and Bathsheba, uh, a prophet, I'm sorry, came to David to tell him that God had said that he was going to take the baby's life. And so David obviously got very upset, and so he started to pray and seek God and just ask God, try, just hoping that God would spare this child's life, and just praying to God, seeking his will and all those kinds of things. And then I love in Second Samuel, maybe it really... Uh, hones in on this a little bit. Uh, ver chapter 12, verses 22 through 23. Uh, this is David's response after the child did die. He said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who knows? The Lord may be gracious to me that the child may live. But now he has died. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? And I want you to really hear this part because this, I think, is our answer. I will go to him but he will not return to me. And so David speaks in hope and in faith that he believed he would go to heaven one day to be with this child because that's where he believed the child was, but that the child would not return from heaven to earth. So I would say this, uh, even though there's not a clear-cut clear -cut verse that speaks to this, I would say absolutely. I believe that uh, babies are in heaven. I believe that David thought the same thing as we can see in Scripture. I can recognize Jesus' love for children, and whatever the case, we just trust in God's love and that he loves children and that we know that wherever the babies are, that he has the best for them, the, the best intentions for them. And you would even, I would even add in questions like this, that you even kind of take a look at the character of God all throughout Absolutely. Scripture and just the love of God for people, that his, his intention from the beginning of time was that he even sent his own son for salvation through, uh, for, so that we could have eternal life through him. So Absolutely. Uh, I Just think that's a good looking answer. looking at the character, everything that he has shown us, he's a God of love. So, Awesome. All right, question number three. Is smoking a sin 
And then what about cussing? So we kind of got a two in one. Is smoking a sin and is cussing a sin? So oh, a, lot of us, a lot of us probably have uh, probably mixed emotions about this. I grew up in a smoking home uh, my whole life. I never knew the difference until I, had, until I got married and moved out. I really never knew, even knew the difference of uh, not seeing my parents smoke. So uh, I've got my own kind of thoughts and opinions on that. And then what about cussing? Brandon Matthews was able to go out this week, uh, and he did a man on the street video. So if you'll take your attention to the screen, we're going to get... Uh, some answers of what people may think of that. Let's see why people consider them curse words. I mean, it's just a different word. What, what makes it so wrong? What makes it so bad? How are you going to be able to accept the Holy Spirit when you're doing something to push it away from you? I mean, if you put smoking before him and like with your religious walk and everything, then it's bad. But if you just do it, it's just like drinking. If you just don't overdo it. I think that God disapprove of smoking and cursing. It should be a kind word. It shouldn't be a negative thought or a negative word. It should all be kind. Well, I think smoking is uh, your own personal choice, but uh, he put it on this earth. And if, if you want to smoke, you should be able to. There is no black and white on it. So it falls under, you know, search out your own soul's salvation with fear and trembling. So, no, he doesn't approve of either one. I think that, I mean, you have to remember that everything you do, your whole life, the way you're living, represents Christ. And just that's what we as Christians live for. All right. Now, everybody's got their own opinion. Let's just kind of take a, a, a poll real quick in here. If, you're, if, if, you, if you think cussing is okay, cussing is okay, let me see your hand. Nobody, nobody, nobody. What about, what about cussing as a sin? I think probably we should watch our language. Anybody? Come on, come on. You have to vote. Yeah, we got some hands up. What about smoking? I think smoking is a sin. Anybody, anybody, anybody? Okay. What about smoking is not a sin? It's okay. It should be left up to your own opinion. We got some. Everybody's afraid to vote. All right. What about, <laughs> what about this? I'm not real sure. I'm not going to answer. Anybody? I don't, I don't really know. We got a <laughs> couple of those. All right. Uh, we're go, we'll kind of attack the smoking side of it first, okay? The scripture, the Bible doesn't speak to smoking, okay? It doesn't say anything about it, and a lot of people would say, well, that's because we didn't have, nobody was smoking. I think the first uh, question to answer would be, uh, it really depends on what you are smoking. What are you smoking? <laughs> there's lots of, <laughs> there's lots of, le- <laughs> some things are illegal. <laughs> some things you just don't need to because it's against the law, okay? Uh, the next uh, thing. And we that- have no experience in those <laughs> I will not confirm or deny <laughs> that. Uh, but the Bible does speak to a scenario. Some of you raised your hand and said, hey, I think it should kind of be left up to you. The Bible does say in Romans chapter 14, and this kind of covers a lot of questions that may be answered over the course of this month. But Paul addresses uh, lots of things. And we'll start in verse 14, verse uh, 20, chapter 14 and verse 20. And Paul says this, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. And he's talking specifically about eating, uh, uh, about being kosher. The Jewish people would eat, only eat certain foods. But this is now they're bringing the gospel to Gentiles. And he says, all food is clean, but, is it, uh, but it is wrong for a person to eat anything that would cause someone else to stumble. Maybe you want to write that part down. And he says, it's better not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything else that would cause your brother or sister to fall. I love that verse. It's better not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything else that would cause your brother or sister to fall. In verse 22, he says, so whatever you believe about these things, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who does not condemn himself by what he approves. For, uh, he says, but whoever has doubts is, uh, is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith. And everything that does not come from faith is sin. So I would, I would say this is my answer. I would say uh, cussing, I mean, uh, smoking, that's not sending someone to hell. That's not the sin that they would commit that would separate them from God. Would I say, is it good for you? Is it healthy for you? Should you do it? Personally, my personal opinion is no. Uh, you shouldn't do it. It's not good for you. And it is a stumbling block for some people around you. Uh, but is it a sin? Is that what uh, the Bible speaks to that as saying it's a sin? I would say no. The Bible doesn't say it's a sin. I would say that the Bible speaks to it as a Romans 14 issue. That it really is a decision you need to make between yourself and God. And if you feel convicted on a, on a situation like that, then you, I would say don't do it. If you don't find conviction in a place like that in your life and your walk with Jesus, I would say in, different, uh, in, in your own uh, timing and place that it's, it's not a sin. The Bible doesn't speak directly against that. Uh, okay, S- cussing. What about cussing? Now, this is something the Bible speaks directly to. Okay, Ephesians 4.29 
He gives us a verse. He says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others, building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. You know, I heard somebody on the video a while ago say, well, you know, it really depends on what makes it a bad word, what, what, uh, what qualifies it as that. And, you know, uh, depending on what place of the country you're in or what culture you're from, different words mean different things. But I would say this, if you're in a culture that calls that or has labeled that as a word that is offensive or wrong, then you should not use it. You should try to use something in your language that's going to build people up and edify those around you. In Colossians 3 verse 8, it says, but you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, Anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. So what does the Bible say about cussing? What does the Bible say about our language? It says, it says, it says to watch what you say. Watch what's coming out of your mouth. You know, my mom used to tell me, Brandon, you can't take it back. Once you pull the trigger, it doesn't come back. What you say carries tons of weight. And the Bible also speaks to this and says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. And it says, those that love it will eat of its fruit in the book of Proverbs. So I would say this, be very careful how we speak and what we say around other people because it needs to edify those around us. So that Always one, the Bible, building up. Yes, that one the Bible directly speaks to. Is cussing a sin? I would say yes because the Bible says don't do it. All right? Question number four. Now this is a live question that came through and uh, I'll read this. Let me back out. we got a bunch of them coming through here. All right, here we go. Derek, I'll let you answer this one. Is it okay to spend the night with my boyfriend if we aren't sexually active? Is it okay to spend the night with my boyfriend? Well, I have never spent the night with my boyfriend. <laughs> so, I don't know if I'm equipped to... Uh, actually, <laughs> I think that I know I'm on... We have... Um, internet in the auditorium now at Cultivate Church of Guests, so I think I have some scripture in Hebrews that uh, would help us out, but as, as, we, as I think about that, I would say this, that if you're a believer, absolutely not. It's not okay. Uh, if you're not a believer in Jesus, I would say that it makes sense, honestly. I, I'm a newlywed. Well, October, I just got married. Yes, taken, taken. Uh, that wasn't even my wife screaming, by the way. I think that was somebody. Uh, she's back there like, oh, no. But when we got married, uh, I started reading a couple of books about marriage, right? To kind of get ahead, you know? And one of the things that I did read, which was very interesting, that most couples that will go on to get married, in this decade, they're predicting around two-thirds of them will have lived together first. And... Uh, so as I think about that, I would say, and I can honestly, if I'm being real, I can kind of see why if you're not a believer. One, because they would, these are the things maybe that they'd say, well, it's a lot cheaper, you know. Uh, two incomes for one apartment is a lot easier to do than one income for, for an apartment. And I, I see that. Uh, I see that well, that would be maybe a reason and a justification. Another thing, um, can we be real? It's uh, uh, you wouldn't buy a car without test driving it first, right? And so everybody's like, oh my gosh, we're in church. Exactly. We're in church. It's okay to be real. You wouldn't do that. And so maybe that's a, a fault. Like, you know, even if it's not uh, a sexual thing, which can I just say, uh, that's, I, I really think 99% of the time that's baloney anyway, that it, it'd be hard to stay the night with somebody. I would say that if you're sitting on the couch too long, it could go places, that's right? It. And so, like, just be careful, set some boundaries. But if you're living together, it's going to go to those places really quickly, I would imagine. And they would, um, so with that thought in mind, maybe, you know, if we stay together, it's cheaper. If we stay together... Uh, we can test each other out. You know, am I going to like the person I wake up beside in the mornings, right? Kind of give it a test run because there's so much divorce, and those are some thoughts that people might have. And also, I think people just look at um, marriage differently than we should as believers. A lot of times we view marriage as just a contract, a formal signing anyway, right? Well, we're married in our hearts already, or some things like that I've heard before. 
I would say uh, that you have not the accurate view of marriage, biblically. A marriage in the Bible is not just a contract. A contract, the best way I've ever heard, a contract versus uh, a covenant is really what marriage is. So contract versus covenant. A contract is protecting me from you and you from me, right? So if we do anything stupid, there's something there to set those boundaries. A covenant is something you enter into, and this is what marriage is, between you, another person, and God. And so when you get married, if uh, a pastor marries you, does the vows, he'll stand up. For example, Pastor Brennan Matthews uh, did me and my wife Nikki's wedding, and he said something in effect, you know, till death do you part, you know, talking about God and those things. And we made a vow to each other and, and to God that, we would stick it out, <laughs> and that uh, we would try to put each other first, and it was, it was a covenant that we made before God. And so it was feelings aside, we're in this. So I would say that we need to understand covenant. And um, in Hebrews 13.4, yeah, 13.4, it says, Marriage should be honored by all, and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and adulterer and all the sexually immoral. So it says marriage should be honored by all. So I would say that means everybody. Whether you're married or not married, it should be honored. Let me give you this maybe as a, a thought. Um, yeah, if, if, if I come home later today and I tell Nikki, I have some cool news. I met this awesome, awesome girl at church today. Okay, one, that's not going to go over well. <laughs> uh, two, and I'll, I'll go on to explain, I feel like I should uh, start spending more time with her one-on-one. -on -one. Do you think she's going to be okay with that? No. Why? <laughs> because we're married. Well, then I'll tell her, well, I'm going to actually start staying the night with this person. But don't worry, I'm sleeping on the couch. You know, nothing's happening. We're just friends. Do you think she's going to be okay with that? No. Why not? Because we're married. Um, marriage should be honored by all in any situation. And as advice, I tell my friends this all the time, and it's something I wish I would have done better. I really tried to do well. But enjoy the stage you are at in life. If you're single, act single. If you're, um, and enjoy that, because it's a great time in your life that God has given you. If you're um, in a dating relationship, keep it pure and act like you're in a dating relationship and set boundaries and to honor God. And if you're married, live it up and enjoy marriage. You know what I mean? Do all the things that come with having a good marriage and uh, those types of situations. So I'd say enjoy that when you're there. And if you are uh, living together, I would, I would strongly just say, I mean, know that I love you, you know, but just also know that scripturally, I would say, get married, you know, take it, make it right before God. Yeah, and the Bible even says in the New Testament that as believers, we should avoid even the very appearance of evil. So, uh, you know, and like you say, anybody sits on the couch long enough, it lead, one thing is always going to lead to another. So that you is can always say, the truth. And we've all got good intentions, and, you know, the old saying goes, you know, hell is paved with, on the road to good intentions. The road to hell is paved with good intentions. So I would say even though you may have good intentions, um, not being sexually active, uh, staying the night with your boyfriend or girlfriend is not going to last very long uh, if you continue down that road. Because the Bible tells us the enemy, it says in 1 Peter 5, 8, it says, Be alert, be on guard. Our enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And I can say if you put yourself in a position that's going to allow, allow a foot in the door with the enemy in your life, that is always going to happen. He's always going to try to attack you, and it's always going to find yourself in a compromising situation. And I would add one last thing. Um, Ephesians 4:11. Uh, basically says to live a life worthy, Ephesians 4, one. excuse me, live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And we see through Scripture all throughout, that's a big calling, it's a great thing on your life. Don't do anything that would separate you from living that calling fully, putting yourself in a position where you can't fulfill that, and also put yourself in a position where others um, wouldn't be able to respect that calling on your life because they're so seeing the sin so evident because you're that's it. That's a good answer. All right, everybody take a deep breath. Go. All right, next question that came in this week uh, made me blush also when I read it, so it's a very <laughs> controversial 
question, but we promised that we would leave no things unturned. And Hold on to yourselves. Yeah, everybody you buckle up. You thought it been up. bad. Just wait. Here we go. Uh, question. Is masturbating without pornography wrong, even though it's physically healthy for you? I love that they even added that uh, part. You know you want to laugh. You can laugh. Even though it is physically healthy for you. Uh, uh, you know, the Bible doesn't specifically speak to this area. So is it wrong? Uh, I would say no, because the Bible doesn't talk about it. The Bible doesn't say anything about it. I had somebody the other day try to, uh, try to use the verse in Ecclesiastes 9 and 10. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all of your might. I said, no, that is, that's not what that's talking about. He's talking about getting a job and working. He's he wasn't not supposed to tell you that. He wasn't about supposed that. to say that. Could not believe that. So, no, the Bible, the Bible doesn't speak to it, okay? Now, what the Bible does speak to is lust, okay? The Bible does speak about lust. In Job 31 and 1, Job said this, I've made a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully, lustfully uh, on a young woman or upon a woman. So, uh, pornography is 100% definitely wrong. It is sin. It is a trick of the enemy to deceive us and to trick us uh, into, into seeing something that is completely fake and wrong and, and, and not right in God's eyes and in our eyes. So we begin to live in this virtual reality world uh, when pornography is, is evident in our lives. And you can even tell uh, because I was addicted to pornography for years and I know you can look at a person and the decisions that they're making and really even be in a conversation with them for not very long time and you can tell uh, if, they're, if they're involved in things like this because the, the Bible, I mean the enemy really uh, is very good at deceiving people with this trick. So uh, I would say this, that masturbating without pornography, uh, the Bible doesn't say that it's wrong. It's not uh, a sin, but let's be honest, nobody's thinking of mowing the yard uh, during that time. You can't, you're not thinking about going outside and working on the car. It's a very sexual uh, thought process going on. So, uh, and if you are, we need to talk later. We do, you have problems, we have issues. Uh, so I would say this, if there's a way that you can figure out how to do that and not think lustfully uh, in some situation, then the Bible doesn't say it's a sin. So we can't call it a sin unless the Bible says it's a sin. So just be very, 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 I would and caution you to be very cautious in this area. You know, the, uh, they said even though it's physically healthy for you and there's lots of, um, there's lots of scientific uh, studies and thought processes that says uh, that sexual activity is healthy for the body. I mean, I read an article this past week that even talks about uh, masturbation specifically talks about, you know, psychologically though, you're, you're proverbially playing with fire mm -hmm. because it's a very addictive thing to get involved with. And the Bible even talks about in the New Testament, Paul even says that I will, I will be mastered by no thing. I will not allow anything to control my life. And I would say that that particular thing, it, it can be very addictive to, uh, to people. And uh, whenever something controls you and becomes controlling in your life and takes charge over your thought process, I would say that that becomes very sinful. So, so uh, in answering the question specifically, no, the Bible does not say it is a sin, but actually in reality it is attached to every, uh, lots of forms of sin. And those things uh, can lead to uh, very harmful and uh, destructive things in your life. So my advice would be stay away from that. If you're, uh, if you're struggling with sexual sin, Paul says in, uh, in 1 Corinthians, hey, get married. Get married or burn is what he says. So if you're struggling, if you're struggling with sexual sin, sexual addiction, or uh, things in your life, hey, you need to go find a spouse and you need to be serious about uh, finding a marriage relationship. All right? All right. Not too bad. Everybody okay? We good? Making right. it through. All right. Question, next question is a live question. Uh, so we'll bring this up. Question is, what about astrology? What do you think about astrology? Derek, you want to answer that? Yes. Uh, astrology, okay, astrology would be sorcery in the Bible, considered sorcery. I know in Deuteronomy, yeah, Deuteronomy it speaks about um, the different forms of witchcraft and sorcery. And it basically, we just need to understand that astrology is when you look to the, the stars for answers, and that is wrong. Like, you should never look, uh, Carmen gave us the best, Carmen is a, uh, 90s, 80s, 90s Christian singer. And he said, why look to the stars when you could look to the maker of the stars kind of thing? And so I feel like Carmen answered this for us. Yeah, astrology uh, looks to the stars. and Really, that's witchcraft. So horoscopes, all those kinds of things. Yeah. It's sorcery. 
And, and the Bible is totally against that, says no. Look to God. Now, I would say this, astronomy, studying stars, is not a sin or a bad thing. But when you look to the stars for answers on your life, that would be a no-no. Yeah, and I would even say scripturally, the Bible even teaches us and, and as believers that uh, we need to find our answers to life in the Word of God. And don't uh, put any other gods before me. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times, you know, in astrology and uh, study of the stars, when they, and especially uh, when Deuteronomy talks about that, they, people were actually going to... Uh, 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 People, they were looking at that to see their future. So fortune tellers, any kind of fortune tellers, things like that. That's what they were going to, and it literally led people to, to worship other gods and other deities. So absolutely, the difference is astronomy or astrology. Uh, if you're looking at astrology, we would say, man, you don't, you, don't need to, you don't need to dabble into those things because you're allowing the enemy into your life and you're allowing him a foothold again uh, in, into controlling different, context, different uh, context of your life. So I would say, just like you said, that's wrong. We need to look to God and look to God's word for answers in our life. And remember, 2 Timothy, again, all scripture is breathed by God. It's for our correction, our instruction. It's for us to learn the, con- the character, the love, the mercy, the grace of God in our life. He wrote it all in his book so that we could have a map to live our lives by according mm-hmm. to his will. So I would look to that before I would look to anything else. Listen to Carmen, man. Listen, Listen to either. Carmen. All right, next question we got through uh, the internet this week. Is there, such a sexual, is there such a thing as sexual impurity between a husband and a wife? Is there such a thing be- between sexual impurity between a husband and a wife. You know what's crazy is the New Testament, especially in 1 Corinthians, speaks a lot about sexual purity uh, in the context of living a Christian life. And uh, the reason about that is because Paul had come uh, into this city, Corinth, and uh, found out as he got into it that this was a completely just corrupt city. If you know a little bit about the history of Corinth, it was uh, just scattered with sexual immorality. They had, uh, they had temples built to uh, sex goddesses, and there were prostitutes uh, that would serve in these temples. So uh, uh, everywhere you looked was literally just sexual immorality everywhere. Every form, every thought, every facet of it was all there and available. So Paul would write extensively to the church there in Corinth because what would happen is they would almost get twisted in, in, in their thought process. And anybody ever seen people just compromise in their walk with Jesus and find comprom- uh, and just find different ways that they would just kind of bend the rules and try to... And that's what was going on. So Paul speaks about it uh, in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, and he says this verse when it talks about uh, uh, sexual impurity in a marriage relationship and in relationships altogether. And he says this, he says, all things are lawful for me. He says, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So I would say this, the Bible speaks about the marriage relationship as being undefiled. Uh, when, when God tells us that he wants us, and it's crazy because it talks about the analogy of our relationship with God, he always uses the marriage analogy, the marriage relationship. And I would say in the context of marriage, both husband, both wife being on the same page, on the same, uh, in the same context of each other, knowing their relationship, both pursuing God and both pursuing their relationship with one another, uh, that sexually the marriage bed is undefiled and it is holy and it is something between you guys and God. A great book, you maybe want to write this down, that is written, Mark and Grace Driscoll wrote an incredible book on the marriage relationship and uh, they leave no stone unturned and it's called Real Marriage. Uh, Real Marriage, and it's by Mark and Great Driscoll. So lots of the questions that you may have about your sexual relationship and marriage, they answer just about every kind of question you can think of. So it's a great book to go to. But I would say this, that is there such a thing as sexual impurity? I would say yes. Uh, and, and, and here's where, in the context of what I'm saying. If, uh, if a husband is trying to, get, trying to ask his wife or trying to force his wife to do something sexual that she's not comfortable with or she's not okay with, then I would say, yes, that's wrong and that's sinful. And you need to, you need to repent and walk away from that. But if you're both on the same page and you're both on uh, seeking God and pursuing relationship with God and one another, I would say that you guys just need to keep, that, keep the marriage bed undefiled as it talks about mm-hmm. and, uh, and know it's between you guys and God. So that's my answer to that. And again, that book, grab that book, pick it up and read. It's a great book uh, about just the marriage relationship in general. Uh, Real Marriage by Mark and Grace Driscoll. I think that's strong. That good? Everybody good? All right. Next question we have here. Uh, it's our final question of the day. And uh, this is a really weighty question, a heavy question yeah. that probably a lot of us deal with. Um, and it says this, if I do not forgive the people that hurt me, am I still going to heaven? If I don't forgive the people who hurt me, am I still going to heaven? 
Wow. Okay. Um, I know I just want to start off by saying I totally understand that everybody in this room and everybody that watches us over the internet, uh, you've, we've all experienced hurt and pain and dealt with having to forgive and then honestly having people to for, forgive us. Uh, so I don't even want to pretend like I know your situation as I answer this question or maybe what someone's did to you or the hurt they've caused in your life. I have, you know, I, obviously people have hurt me before, but I might not have any idea with certain situations, so I'm not even pretending that. But I want to go straight to Scripture, Matthew 6, 14 through 15, and it should be on the screen. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. And that's pretty strong and pretty straightforward. Um, I will say this, there is a really a conditional statement in there, the word if. If you forgive, then you receive something, then you will receive forgiveness. So I would almost, I would say the flip side of that is if you do not forgive, then you will not be forgiven. Uh, but I want to stop there and remind us that it is not through works that we receive salvation, and that includes forgiving people. Yeah. Forgiveness is always a byproduct out of your relationship with God. That's it. When you have, when God has come into your life and you've accepted Him and you're starting to walk with Him and know Him, uh, just enjoy His presence, something that always comes is forgiveness. Learning to forgive those. I've heard this said before, and I believe it is the absolute uh, truth that Christians should be the hardest people to offend. Some of us wear our feelings on our sleeves and a little anything gets us offended and then we're going to have a bad day and never forgive the person. And I would say if that is you, uh, I would check myself with my relationship with God because yeah. a, a relationship with God, it just alters all of that. Um, I also love in Colossians 3 verse 13, it says, Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And that's not a suggestion. <laughs> that was a straight-out commandment. Forgive like God forgave you. Now, that's real weighty because look at the forgiveness that God has shown to us. Yeah. And as we look at that, it's, that's a big deal that he, he did send his son. He yeah. did uh, uh, die on the cross for us. And I would even say this. Even as Jesus was on the cross, he had seven statements, Okay which was not getting into all of it, a really hard thing for him to do was to talk while on the cross being suffocated. That's how he was dying uh, from the cross. And so anytime you would talk during that, it's a big deal, okay? Yeah. <laughs> and you might want to listen to what he's saying. And one of those statements was, Father, forgive them. Mm. Uh, and, and so that's the kind of way he has forgiven us and the weight of that. So when we understand the way he has forgiven us, and how much it was a priority, and his mission, then it puts a lot of, I guess, um, a, lot, a lot of impact, and that's the way we should learn to forgive others. And that can only happen through the Holy Spirit. And I would even uh, say this. It's a command. You said it wasn't, this wasn't a suggestion. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't say this. Going to the character of God and who God is for our lives, God would never command us to do something that was impossible. God would never command his children to do something that was completely impossible. That would be an unloving, uncaring God. So when God says forgive so that you can be forgiven, it is completely relational. It's, and it really, that statement, like you said a while ago, that statement hinges on our relationship with Jesus, our relationship with God. So when we've hear, I've heard people say my whole life, I don't know if I could ever forgive that offense. I don't know if I could ever let that go. And I would say this, and this is, this is a tough statement to swallow, so I'll go ahead and prepare, and I wish we could lighten it up. But the, like he just said, forgiven people forgive. Absolutely. People who are forgiven, they forgive. And I would say just some quick application with that. Real fast, you might want to even jot this down. I'm like, how do I do that? Well, I would say the first place you start is you recognize your own sin and God's forgiveness towards you as a believer. Like when you start to... When you start to see your own sinfulness, when you recognize that and that God had mercy on you, it's easier to start showing mercy on others. Yes. Uh, and also know that that mercy is not a one-time shown thing. Right. 
And it's a daily choice. It all, you might have to forgive someone for something they did 20 years ago every day for the rest of your life. And that's truth. Uh, but it's a choice that you make that I will forgive. Secondly, uh, you might want to jot this down. Uh, repent for the unforgiveness that's in your own heart towards others. Just the things that you know are there, you know, go ahead and repent for those. And finally, I would say, respond in love. Respond in love. Um, don't, I'm not, when we talk about forgiveness, that is not a, um, you're not having to stay in a bad, I'm not asking anyone to stay in a bad situation to where it was like an abusive relationship, someone's hurting you, all those kinds of things. You can find forgiveness and God could use that forgiveness as a miracle. Yeah. Uh, so I would say absolutely that God wants us to have this heart of forgiving. There's a great story uh, where this woman in the New Testament and she just busts open the doors and comes in. And she is not a woman most of the guys would have wanted to be around. And so there's Jesus and these religious leaders and the disciples are sitting, eating a meal. And this woman busts in and she has this alabaster box. And she comes to Jesus and she just busts it open. And she just, in an alabaster box, it had all this perfume in it. And it was a very, very expensive item. And she just starts pouring it onto his feet. And the disciples and maybe some of the religious leaders around are like, what are you doing? Don't do that. And as she's pouring it onto his feet, you know, he makes this remark. He says, I tell you, her sins, though they are many, have been forgiven because she, she has shown much love. But a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. So I just want to take this time and maybe that you need to ask God to forgive you for the first time in your life and be shown that forgiveness. I just want to give that opportunity today. At Cultivate, we don't try to do anything funny or weird, but we just want to give you a chance to respond to that love of God and allow him to forgive you. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to ask that everybody would just bow your head and close your eyes. And I'm going to ask Pastor Brandon Doss just to really lead us into a time of prayer and uh, repenting. Yeah, maybe that's you today. Maybe you're here and you say, Pastor Brandon, man, I've never really given my heart fully to Jesus. Man, there's so much bitterness in my heart or, or, or hate or anger, maybe toward other people. And I realize maybe that's because I've never really accepted true forgiveness in my heart from Jesus. And if you're in this room, nobody's looking, nobody's going to embarrass you. We want to offer an opportunity for you to find that freedom that really is in Jesus Christ. And you say, Pastor Brandon, that's me. I just want to give my heart to Jesus. Maybe for the first time, I want to submit my life completely to him and experience that forgiveness. If that's you, nobody's looking, just slip your hand up so that we can pray with you. I see that hand right back to the right. I'm proud of you. Best decision you could ever make right here in the middle. Come on. These are people that are saying, today I'm giving Jesus my life. I want to find real freedom in relationship with him. Anybody else? Don't let this time pass by. It's an opportunity you have to start fresh and new with Jesus. Maybe you're watching online. I'd love for you to make that decision and let somebody know about that. Let us know. Send us an email. And let us know what God's doing in your life. I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and we're just going to ask God that he would do what he says he would do in his word. You get to start fresh and new with a new life in Jesus Christ. Maybe you can just say this prayer in your heart after me. Dear Jesus, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you that you loved me so much that you came, lived a sinless life, and, and sacrificed yourself for my sin. Today, today I commit my life fully to you. Through your, through your grace and through your mercy, I start fresh, completely clean. I lay every sin down. I lay my past at your feet, and I'm going to walk out of here different. Father, I pray blessing over every person that made that decision today. We celebrate new life in Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.